from downtown Detroit. Local 4 News at 5 starts now. Is it too early to use the phrase Arctic blast? Well, that's what we've got, and it's headed this way for tomorrow. I'm Rod Maloney in Flint, where police have been searching for body parts in a park for two days now, and there is a fresh scene developing. We'll have full details. But we begin with chilling testimony in court. The victim of a sex assault tells her story of the night she was attacked. Thanks for being with us for the News at 5. The two men charged in three rape cases in three cities were in court today for a key hearing. Aaron Stewart and Quentin Flemons are charged with carrying out the attacks together. Today, one of the accusers took the stand, and Steve Garagiola uh, standing by live. Steve, this was difficult to listen to at times. Well, it was hard to hear. Can't even imagine the pain of the woman who had to give the testimony. The two men charged with sexual assault kidnapping and robbery. This was an attack that happened in September in Detroit. Today was a preliminary hearing. The primary witness was the victim who had to relive her nightmare. It was the victim in the Detroit rape who testified this afternoon. She describes a white van pinning her against the curb. Two men jump out and grab her. They both just grabbed me and picked me up right off the ground and I was kicking and screaming and they just carried me and put me in the van. According to the victim, as the two men drove her around, the one pinning her to the floor of the van said that he's not afraid to kill someone or that he will kill someone if he needs to or he spills the blood or something like that. The victim says they stopped the van in an alley near an abandoned building and both climbed in the back seat and tore at her clothes. I gave up and they pinned me down. Uh, the shorter guy was down, straddling, straddling like my legs, and the taller guy was up towards my shoulders holding me down. The victim says she was raped multiple times. The taller guy said, why do you get to go first? And the shorter guy said, you went first last time. Also testifying today, a nurse who performed an examination of the victim afterwards. Can you tell the judge about any, any, anything based on your experience uh, regarding the injuries that you noticed uh, on this patient? These injuries that occurred are the worst injuries I have ever seen in my career. Just a horrible ordeal for that woman. And how brave is she to get on the stand and relive that nightmare? The judge set bond of $500,000 cash for one of the men, $1 million bond cash for the other. He said he does not consider them a flight risk, but does consider them a threat to the community. Devin and Kimberly, back to you. It's extraordinary the way uh, she held it together during that testimony, Steve. The, the remark about uh, you went first last time, though, speaks to my question. T talk about the other cases here. Yeah, absolutely. A similar case, similar uh, modus operandi, if you will. A woman on a bicycle attack, the white van in Highland Park and in Hamtramck. Similar charges, sexual assault, kidnapping, robbery entirely different cases. So for these two, it's a long road in the legal system. Oh, goodness gracious. All right, Steve. Uh, let's get to some breaking news now out of Lansing, where the state Senate has just approved a pair of bills to allow concealed carry of firearms at schools. Uh, the bill would also allow people to carry in churches and other public spaces. Supporters of the bills argue that in some cases, citizens may need to be armed because police might not be there when something bad is happening. Critics are concerned about the minimum level of training that's required. These bills, though, now go over to the state house for consideration. Should point out Governor Snyder did veto a similar bill when it came to him back in 2012. Developing right now in Flint, where police and federal agents have swarmed a park where human remains have been found. But here's where the story gets interesting. With all the police and feds on the scene, they're saying virtually nothing about what this is all about. Uh, Rod Maloney is live in Flint tonight. Rod, you just got some new information, though. Yeah, we did, Kimberly. A lot more questions asked than answered here, and we're just seeing a new scene developing here because they have been looking for body parts in this park for two days now. They had cleared the scene. In fact, the FBI agents and everybody else had gone home. But now the neighbors say that they had a dog find what they believe could be more human remains in the park. And so the police now are returning. 
Yesterday morning, a man out walking his dog found human remains in Broom Park, which is also known as Lincoln Park, and he called 911 right away. But he had to go to a doctor's appointment. Flint police came out and tried to find the body, but they couldn't. Around noontime, an MTA bus driver called in, having seen the body parts, and when police arrived and found those incomplete remains of two different people, the investigation began. Deputy Flint Police Chief Devin Bernritter told us in a news conference. The uh, nature of what was discovered is going to require a forensic analysis. This was the scene yesterday and yet again today. FBI, Michigan State Police, Genesee County Sheriff's deputies, and Flint police detectives fanning out over a wide expanse in the park and also across 12th Street at Southwest Academy looking to see if other body parts were there. We cannot give you a reason specifically at this time that what was found was where it was when it was located. Flint police went out of their way to say this display of police presence is not an extraordinary event, but tell that to the neighbors. I'm scared for the community, for people that walk through the park, or, you know, walking up and down the street. It is, frightens me because we have kids in the neighborhood. That it's supposed to be quiet and nice for the kids to be able to play in because it's a park. Now, this scene that's developing behind me here now just happened in the last half hour. We were down the street. The neighbors came and said they thought that a dog had found what they believed to be a hand in a plastic bag buried here in the park. They called 911. The police came out. The first officer was here. She taped off the area. And now, as you can see, we have half a dozen police cars out here. And it looks like they're beginning to try and do a larger search around this part of the park. And so it has been an eventful day out here, to say the least. Back to you. And Rod, it sounds like you were able to talk to quite a few neighbors while you were out there. Uh, what are they saying about that park? Well, one of the things that we're hearing uh, repeatedly from the neighbors here is that they believe that a number of young women have disappeared from this area. Now, whether you can connect that to what's going on here or not, we do not know. But they are deeply concerned that people are disappearing from this area, and now they have body parts found in the neighborhood park. They're deeply concerned about what has happened to these, these people they think could be involved in this case. Yeah, understandably so. Uh, Rod, I know you'll keep us posted. Thanks. And Rod is going to have to switch jackets for tomorrow. <laughs> Winter yeah. is about to blow in here. Yeah, that's right. And a, and a chance of seeing, dare I say, s -s 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 snowflakes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's get over to bed. It's going to get colder, too. It is, and that's how we're all going to be talking tomorrow afternoon. I wanted to start by showing low temperatures this morning, where we all were in the 20s. But tomorrow, we will feel colder than this before the sun even goes down. And then we've got further to fall once it gets dark. Currently, though, we're 47. Not too bad considering where we were this morning. But tomorrow is a different story. We're going to start out at 31 at the bus stop at 7 a.m. Once we get into the afternoon, kids coming home still about 40 degrees. But that's when the drops start falling. A couple snowflakes mixed in there. But we haven't even started talking the effect of wind on those falling temperatures tomorrow. We'll talk more about that in your four zone forecast coming up, guys. Tonight, Vice President Mike Pence is offering support in Sutherland Springs, Texas. His visit comes in the wake of a massacre that killed 26 people and injured 20 others. An EMT was off duty Sunday morning, but rushed to the scene to find her mother injured and her father killed. I don't know if you really can wrap your head around it. It's just so much tragedy and so much loss, senseless loss. Meanwhile, we are getting a clearer picture of the gunman. In the summer of 2012, Devin Kelly escaped a New Mexico Behavioral Health Center. That was just months after he was accused of abusing his first wife and her child and spending 12 months in a military prison. Under Texas law, Kelly's record of domestic violence should have barred him from purchasing the gun. City of Warren has a big police presence tonight at the Macomb County Republican Dinner. The keynote speaker former White House strategist and current executive chairman of Breitbart News, Steve Bannon. Let's bring in Paula Tutner, who's live outside the Andiamos in Warren. And I guess uh, we've got some protests expected for Bannon's visit, Paula. They, they do, and they are starting to show up. I, I wouldn't say in huge numbers, so on this side. So this is the west side of 14 miles, so west of Andiamo's building. And you have about 50, maybe 60 people have started to gather on this side, which would be the east side. You have maybe five or six people who are pro-Trump, pro-Bannon. I have to imagine that the majority of people who are pro-Trump 
are probably inside right now. It's the dinner hour. Uh, Steve Bannon is expected to speak in just a little while, but conversely, this is what I want to show you is right over here, Norman Pan right here. And you have the mounted police right here. And honest to goodness, no fewer than 35 uh, clothed or uniformed police officers that I have encountered or have seen and quite a few that are unseen. The bottom line is they don't know what to expect. And so the police department here is loaded for bear. We have a task force of officers, obviously from the Warren Police Department, Sterling Heights, the Macomb County Sheriff's Department, the state police, and we have other agencies involved in the operation. Keep the pro and con groups apart, the protesters separate. So we'll have a, a detailed plan as how we're doing that. And we have a detailed plan as far as what actions will be taken, which I'm not a, going to really expand on at this point. We're not sure as far as the numbers, we could have uh, 25, 30 protesters, or we could have three or 400. So we're well prepared for whatever number of protesters may be there. Our goal and our responsibility is to keep a safe environment. Okay, safe environment it is. So let's take you inside. This is inside Andiamo's. You can see that Steve Bannon has not taken the stage yet. The program hasn't started yet. People are just now filing inside. Again, those people who are against Steve Bannon being here. Uh, listen, and this is what this country is. It is all about free speech. You don't have to like what's being said, but we have the freedom to say what we want to say. And so Steve Bannon is inside. You've got people here. The crowd is gathering just a bit outside who are protesting. They've got signs that say no state hate, as well as other slogans that are basically saying they don't appreciate the presence of this man in this county. Guys, back to you. Yeah, all right, we'll keep an eye on what's going on there, as well as his remarks uh, coming up from Steve Bannon. All right, Paula. Uh, questions surround the results of uh, a critical race in Detroit last night. New tonight, why a candidate for Detroit clerk says he's considering asking for a recount. Also, new developments in the deadly rock throwing incident along I-75. What police are now doing in the case as that investigation expands. Sean? The feds raiding a home here in the early morning hours in Canton. Local four cameras are there this afternoon. The U.S. attorney announcing charges that they have busted a street gang in Detroit, one of its members living here in Canton. New at 6. An investigation has been underway inside this veterans hospital in Ann Arbor after doctors were mistakenly told not to resuscitate a patient. New at 6, we've got the report that reveals what went so terribly wrong. Let's find out why the charges against a police officer in this deadly crash just went from misdemeanor to felony. We are learning more tonight about a number of raids that were carried out this morning by federal agents. In all, at least six locations were raided by ATF agents, including this home in Canton on Lee Court near Gettys and Beck Roads. Let's get to Sean Lay live tonight. Sean, we're getting a clearer picture of what this is all about. Very busy morning, and we do know more tonight, Kimberly. Here's the deal. It's all about taking down street gangs, one in particular operating here on Detroit's east side, but with that tie to Canton. I feel a lot more safer now. Laura Ebay says street gangs controlled this section of East 7 Mile near Mound so aggressively that she simply couldn't walk to the store. That party store right there, they was hanging out up there, just gang, like just crowds, just hanging out, smoking, drinking, doing what they wanted to do. The feds say the gang called itself Smoke Camp. This is a Facebook profile photo of one of its alleged members, his real name, Jeray Key. And Key was last living in Canton. That's where this morning the ATF raided a home on a quiet cul-de-sac. The U.S. attorney says Key allegedly sold guns to fellow gang members and then bragged about gang business on Facebook. The U.S. attorney says the Detroit Police Gang Intelligence Unit helped take down the gang, teaming up with the feds. But what about one of the gang's alleged members living out in the suburbs? We follow the evidence uh, wherever it takes us. Neighbors in Canton were shocked to see the raid going down here on Lee Court. The suspected gang members were indicted today on federal charges of organized crime and massive drug and gun sales. This gang was involved in a lot of violent activity, and the best way to get rid of it, you got to take out the key people. Now, the ATF telling us tonight a dozen key alleged members of this gang arrested today in the raids and roundup. However, 
The ATF now looking for two other members right now, Daryl Key and Carlos Davis. The ATF says give them a call if you can help. Kimberly. Sean, is there any indication that uh, this gang activity was actually happening in Canton, in that neighborhood? Par apparently not. The ATF tonight saying that most of the gang activity was taking place in the northeast section of the city, but one of those members living out in Canton, and that's the activity we saw today when they went to arrest him. Yeah, again, if anybody knows those two uh, pictures that we sh showed there on the screen, certainly call ATF. Okay, Sean, we appreciate it. Let's put it up for a vote. How many people want to let Ben do his thing and tell us what's coming, or should we just move Let's on? Let's just skip it. <laughs> Can I demand a recount? <laughs> Can we do that again? It's a good time for it, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah this is not one of the, uh, the more fun forecasts, but Mother Nature gave us a little bit of a dry run this morning, and then tomorrow's going to be the real deal. First, let's talk precipitation. You can see the snow. Uh, that's already starting to stack up here in northern parts of Minnesota. The good news for us is by the time that works its way here, this is mostly going to be rain, although it will transition back to snow as we get some of the colder air behind the front. So timing wise, uh, that front's going to start to arrive. We'll call it about two o'clock as it slices through the area. And you can see the green. That's going to be the rain that comes in first. And then probably by four or five o'clock, we'll see that transition back to snow. This whole area of moisture is going to be drying out the whole time, so we're really not anticipating a lot, but there'll be a few flakes around, and you can see from the timing, it's not going to be good news for folks who are driving home tomorrow, so just expect to be slowed down considerably, even though the amount of snow has got not going to be terrible. High pressure settles in on Friday, clears us out, and then we watch our next system come in for the weekend, and we'll discuss that coming up. So you want to bundle up before you get in the car, uh, and that's what these two did on uh, storm pins. This is from Royal Oak. They're ready to go, and uh, looks like they got the blanket on top of them too. So uh, pet's going to be ready tomorrow, uh, not only because of uh, what we're expecting with the snow, but the temperatures and the wind chills, and that's what we're going to talk about next. Currently, we're at 47 degrees, but we fast forward tomorrow morning before that front comes through here. Not too bad. We'll start out above freezing here at 8 a.m., and then once we get later into the afternoon, that cold front starts moving in by by noon, we're still up to 47, 48 degrees here in our metro zone and parts of the east side. So very similar to what we saw today. It's just coming early. So once we get into the afternoon hours, here comes the front. Temperatures start dropping behind it. We'll be into the 30s by 4 o'clock. And by the time the sun goes down, we're going to be in the 20s in most locations. And we've still got ways to fall as we get into that coldest night of the season. I know we've been saying that a lot, but that's truly the case as we get into tomorrow. So let's look at wind chills tomorrow at 5 p.m. This is how it's going to feel 25 in the city, 19 for a wind chill in Troy, and then you start getting outside of the city and we're going to see teens for wind chills in a lot of the area. 17 out Nonstead, all teens here in our west zone. Again, this is 5 p.m. tomorrow, how it's going to feel as uh, we finish out the day and as cold as 12 up in Lapeer, and that's a 5 p.m. wind chill. That's not even counting what's going to happen after that as we get into the nighttime hours. So again, those highs are going to be coming around noon. We were not going to get to the freezing mark on Friday. We'll recover <laughs> a little bit over the weekend, but we've got some snow turning to rain on Sunday. So yeah, it's uh, it's getting there. Here we go. Yeah. All right, let's check in with the good doctor. Hi, doc. Hey there, opioids in the ER. A new study is shedding light into how pain should be managed in the emergency room. That's ahead in good health. All right, Frank, but first we've got stories from across the state, including what this man is accused of doing that has now launched a hate crime investigation. The local for Across Michigan tonight, stories from Clio and up in Traverse City. But we want to start with a troubling story out of Muskegon Heights. That's where the teenager who allegedly beat and robbed another teen for being gay was arraigned today. Muskegon Heights police say Trevon Godbolt lured his 17 year old victim into a dark area where he forced the victim to strip down and began to beat him. During the beating, Godbolt yelled gay slurs at the victim. Police are trying to add a hate crime charge, even though there is no current charge for assault in Michigan based on sexual orientation. In Clio, investigators are planning on executing a number of search warrants to, to try to find out exactly what happened in that rock throwing incident that resulted in the death of Kenneth White. Police are trying to put together a timeline of what the teens were doing before White's death. They believe that they'd been throwing rocks off another overpass near Birch Run earlier that night. Genesee County Police have already executed two warrants. They expect to issue four more, we're told, this week.
And finally, in Traverse City, where Police Chief Jeff O'Brien is accused of misconduct and is currently under investigation, O'Brien confirmed the investigation, saying he is cooperating fully. The investigation is over the city's policy against harassment, discrimination, and workplace violence. New at 530. This has already happened to a few people across the country and right here in Michigan. It's a new dating scam, and this one could get you in trouble with the law. One year ago today, President Trump making history with what many call an unexpected victory to become the 45th president of the United States. I'm Blaine Alexander at the White House with a look at the job he's done so far and what that means for other Republicans around the country. Garland Gilchrist lost the vote for city clerk in Detroit to Janice Winfrey by the narrowest of margins. And now he's got some questions about the vote. And when he got to the polling place, he was actually told that he already voted by absentee ballot, which he had not done. Memories of 2016. Will we see a recount? It's better. The results in the race for Detroit City Clerk causing some controversy tonight. And now the candidate who lost says he's considering demanding a recount. Good evening, everybody. The race for Detroit City Clerk was very, very close last Awfully night. Awfully close, as you see here, just a 1,400 vote difference. Now, Garland Gilchrist, the challenger, says he might want a recount. We bring in Steve Garagiola with more. This is really interesting, Steve, because throughout the evening, uh, Gilchrist was leading most of the night, and then a very dramatic shift occurred late in the evening. Absolutely, and I think that shift is what has prompted all this talk about a recount. The Gilchrist people were feeling very good all night, and they felt it slipped away very quickly. And uh, the word that came up today most often was transparency. They want to see how this election played out. Now, whether or not this leads to an actual recount, we still don't really know. It was the closest race in Detroit. Janice Winfrey winning re-election as the city's clerk by a mere 1,400 votes. Early results last night had Gilchrist in the lead. But a late surge attributed to absentee ballots for Winfrey gave her the election. I think that those are the ones that were starting to come in later, and that's where we started to see the tide shift. And that just causes us, and I think causes voters, to really want to understand what's going on. Gilchrist says his people heard about numerous irregularities from voters who chose absentee ballots. There were multiple absentee voters who actually received multiple confirmation receipts after only casting one ballot. Gilchrist says voters also encountered irregularities at the polls yesterday. And there was a gentleman who went to vote at Western High School in Southwest Detroit. And when he got to the polling place, he was actually told that he already voted by absentee ballot, which he had not done. State law doesn't allow precincts to be recounted when the number of voters in the poll book doesn't match the number of ballots in the ballot box. So at this point, Gilchrist doesn't know if he can even get a complete recount. We've been talking about since March that the way that votes are counted needs to be open and transparent for everyone to see, to remove those questions, to remove that doubt. Now, nobody's making any accusations of any kind of fraud, but they are talking about mistakes, as he alluded to uh, this afternoon. So where it stands right now is he says they are putting together a plan to see if a recount is an advisable step to take. Back to you. Uh, I, as I remarked last night, Steve, there's sort of an irony about a recount in the clerk's office, given that the clerk is the one counting the votes. So uh, since the clerk is where the votes are counted, talk a little bit about how a recount would be handled. Well, you know, the, the irony in this, too, if the numbers don't match in these precincts and they can't do a recount because of errors, that would benefit the clerk who won. Oh, so well, it's, it's her true. system. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, if her system didn't work, she wins. Uh, the Board of Canvassers for Wayne County have to certify the vote. So within the next couple of weeks, then, uh, the Gilchrist people will look at the numbers and decide if they want to spend the money yeah. to get a recount. Can be a very expensive uh, effort, that's for sure. All right, Steve. A former Romeo High School football coach is headed to jail for soliciting students for sex. Back in September, 25-year-old Hector Tanner pleaded guilty to using a computer to commit a crime and accosting children for immoral purposes. After texting two different high school girls, 15 and 16 years old, asking them for sex. Prior to sentencing today, Tanner broke into tears as he addressed the courtroom. I made a huge mistake. I take full responsibility for it. I express so much remorse. I'm not perfect. <laughs> I'm not asking for a slap on the wrist, Judge. I'm just trying to say that I'm sorry to you. 
Tanner was sentenced to six months in Macomb County Jail, followed by five years of probation and will be forced to register as a sex offender. One year to the day after winning the White House, President Trump is in China, basking in the perks, but also exercising the grave responsibilities of his office. Blaine Alexander reports that while he is celebrating his anniversary, he's also commenting on an election day that left Democrats with a lot to celebrate yesterday. Well, Devin, many say that President Trump was once again on the ballot last night, but this time in the form of Republicans all across the country. And based on those results, we're seeing a different outcome than this time last year. Election Day 2016. Thank you. Thank you very much. Donald Trump making history, defying Thank expectations you, to Thank become you. America's 45th president. One year later, marking that anniversary in Asia. I celebrate with you. Addressing South Korea's National Assembly before heading to China. Along the way, tweeting this picture. Congratulations to all the deplorables who gave us a massive electoral college victory. But this election day, back at home, it's Democrats' turn to celebrate, winning closely watched governor's races in Virginia and New Jersey and other victories down the ballot. I think it's clear that uh, Donald Trump has been toxic for the Republican Party. Democrats, even some Republicans, pinning blame on the president himself. I think it was a referendum one uh, in the division and the divisive rhetoric that's in the country right now. Nearly 10 months in office, three of President Trump's signature campaign promises, repeal Obamacare, build a border wall, and pass tax reform, remain undone. If anything, this just puts more pressure on making sure we follow through. So are Republicans worried about midterm elections next year? No, I like a good fight. If this election is any indication, the president and his party just might get it. And while President Trump is away in Asia, some of his team stayed behind to help push tax reform. Republicans have said that that is a must do to have a chance in the polls next year. At the White House, Blaine Alexander, Local 4. All right, Blaine. Meanwhile, Obamacare made a comeback in Tuesday's elections, its strongest show of support since President Trump was elected, and the GOP spent months in an effort to repeal in the governor's race in Virginia and a ballot initiative in Maine. The Affordable Care Act actually buoyed Democrats. On Capitol Hill today, meanwhile, current and former executives from Equifax and Yahoo appeared before lawmakers after security breaches linked to the companies affected billions of Internet users. Equifax grilled on the 2017 data breach that exposed personal data to more than 100 million customers and Yahoo responding to security breaches on some 3 billion accounts. Speaking to the committee, former Yahoo CEO Marissa Mayer apologized to affected users and put the blame on a specific target. Russian meddling. The threat from state-sponsored attacks has changed the playing field so dramatically that today, I believe all companies, even the most well-defended ones, could fall victim to these crimes. No fines have been levied against either of the two companies at this time. In good health, we continue our look at the opioid epidemic, killing nearly half a million people in the U.S. since 2000. Now a new study tonight is looking at how pain medication is used in the emergency department. So we bring in yeah. our own emergency physician, Dr. McGeorge, with the impact on what you're seeing. Well, Karen and Devin, you know, even though emergency rooms provide a relatively small proportion of the total number of opioids prescribed in America at just under 5%, the emergency department is frankly where many patients are first exposed. And that single exposure can be enough to bring addiction. Emergency physicians want to relieve pain, but a new study shows opioids do not necessarily bring much more pain relief than other medications. What we're seeing from studies such as this is despite people thinking that opiates are a stronger or a better pain medication, it's not really the case when done in a randomized control trial. The study looked at more than 400 people between the ages of 21 and 64 who came to the emergency department with an injury to their extremities, like a broken arm. One group of patients were given a modest opioid and acetaminophen combination for pain. The other group were not given opiates, but rather a combination of ibuprofen and acetaminophen. Researchers found that after two hours, patients in both groups reported about the same reduction in pain. This is important because it suggests patients can be made as comfortable with a non-addictive combination. And the addiction risk to opioids cannot be overlooked anymore. 
we now know that even one prescription, even an index prescription, could potentially cause harm and can put someone on the pathway to addiction. Bottom line, it's important for people to be realistic about their pain level, and having a goal of zero pain with a large opiate prescription is unrealistic and dangerous. Now, one important limitation of this study is that it only addressed the non-addictive alternative, that is acetaminophen plus ibuprofen, basically Tylenol plus Motrin, in extremity injuries. Now, there are other conditions where opiates may frankly still be more effective. It's interesting that the combo would work, because I think most people would yeah. assume that you're taking one or the other, not together. Right. Well, I think that was an important take home here, and that's that ibuprofen plus acetaminophen can be an effective mm. pain relief yeah. strategy. Yeah. 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 Avoid those yeah. opioids mm. as much yeah. as you can. Exactly. Okay. Back to opioids for just a second. Today, Michigan Senator Debbie Stabenow has joined 21 other senators in calling on the White House to provide additional funding to combat the opioid epidemic. Right now, only $57,000. $57,000 available in the Public Health Emergency Fund. The senators say that amount is nowhere near enough to effectively stop the flow of opioids in the U.S. 20 more new DDOT buses are coming to the city of Detroit. The new addition brings the fleet to 300 buses, 100 of which were added in the last three years. DDOT says they plan to add 20 buses each year to modernize the fleet. Right now, the average age of the bus is about eight years old. The new buses will hit the streets of Detroit starting in January. Which is great. Seems there's a problem emerging with Apple's new iPhone 10. What experts are saying about the $1,000 phone that might have you thinking twice before you buy it. Also, a business owner gets a heartwarming surprise after one of his work trucks is damaged. What it is that now has him hunting down the person who rode it to say thank you. It's a new twist on an internet dating scam. What you need to do to protect yourself before you look for love online. Stand tall! Stand tall! Teaching our children how to react when they're being picked on, ridiculed, or even worse, bullied. The research shows that relational aggression starts at four years old. How one program is helping teachers prepare their students for any social situation. Tomorrow at 5. The Jeff New at 6. An alert tonight from Clawson PD. A skimmer, a credit card skimmer found on an ATM in the city. We'll tell you where it was and what you should know. All right, Nick, plus drugstores are packed with products promising to help with your cough, but do any of them really work? There's new research that may change your winter cold strategy. That's coming up at six in good health. So you're looking for love, but you end up in fear of arrest. Scammers hitting online dating sites. It's been done before, but this is a new scam and it's scaring some people. Our consumer investigator Hank Winchester introduces us to a man who doesn't want to show his face, but wants to warn you. People looking for love taken by surprise. We're talking about a new twist on a dating scam and it has people worried. Every day, there are thousands of people online looking for that special someone. Rusty turned to the dating website Plenty of Fish. He met a 27-year-old woman. They started communicating via text message. At some point, she starts to send me, you know, some revealing pictures, and uh, she asked me for the same in return. He played along, sending pictures he now regrets, and then... She said something like, um... Are you ready to do so-and-so to this 17-year-old body? And immediately I responded, 17? Rusty then received a surprise call from the police. Suspicious, he Googled the number, and it showed it was, in fact, the police. He read off, like, three different felony counts and threatened me with, you know, up to, I think it was 25 years in prison. Then he got another call. The girl's father wanted to talk. If he turns the phone over, we will put warrants out and we will come and get you. The dad sounded legit until he implied money may make this nightmare go away. Rusty frantically searched the web and realized he wasn't alone. He was a victim of a scam. You know, sometimes they would ask you for money right away. Sometimes they would wait a couple days to make you worry. Scammers can easily change their numbers to look like someone else's. In this case, the police. There's an app for that. They have people that are fulfilling different roles. Someone is trying to go find new targets. Another person is doing these follow-up calls to try to scare them. Take it from Rusty. Even though the threats aren't real, the fear certainly is. To be innocent and to have that feeling 
is, is, is horrible. The end game here is to get your money. The crooks say it's needed to pay for things like therapy for their daughter or just to hold the victim accountable. And when they do give the money, they tend to ask for more, holding the threat of arrest over your head. Looking for love online, it can be scary for many people, and that's why you have to be safe. We have important safety information for you. You'll find everything you need to know on the Help Me Hank page at clickondetroit.com. I'm Hank Winchester. Help Me Hank. And there are many success stories of people who are meeting their spouses online on those dating sites. But the big takeaway here, don't send compromising photos. Without that leverage of the pictures, these scammers have little power. Apple's new iPhone 10 is its highest priced phone ever, mm -hmm. bringing in a thousand bucks. Apparently the high price isn't the only record that the phone is breaking. It's also the most fragile. Uh, Apple has called its screen the most durable glass ever in a smartphone. That's their quote. Well, the warranty provider Square Trade is disagreeing after the six foot drop test determined that the iPhone 10 is the easiest to break uh -oh. and, as a bonus, the most expensive screen to fix. Uh, repair uh, right now on a screen costs roughly $275. Oh.